grasping clawed hands, slimy tentacles, skeletal fists, all reaching out from the dark to claim you. Is this the monster in the closet, the beast under the bed, or the horrors inside a simple item of clothing? It's a sunny Saturday afternoon in the early days of summer. The sky is a bright, cloudless blue. The sun beams down on the crowds of kids home from school and adults hoping to get out and soak up a little bit of the cheerful energy. It isn't just the students enjoying the fact that school is out for summer either. Teachers are on vacation too. One particular teacher is enjoying her first day off in months, taking full advantage of the free time. She starts the day with coffee and breakfast, then stops by a local ice cream shop for a strawberry cone and heads to one of her favorite summer pastimes, a yard sale. She follows the signs to a driveway filled with what she just knows will be hidden gems. They say one person's trash is another person's treasure, and she is the person who considers those cast-offs to be undiscovered treasures. She picks through the cardboard boxes of yellowed books, bags of worn stuffed animals, crooked shelves, and wooden rocking chairs with paint peeling off. After picking up the third shoe in a row that doesn't seem to have a matching partner, she's beginning to think that this particular yard sale might be a bust. But then, she spots it, draped over the back of an overstuffed orange couch. It's a coat made from fine, high-quality wool. She doesn't have much need for a wool coat in the summer, but it looks so nice that she can't help but pick it up to get a better look. The material is heavy and sturdy in her hands, smelling faintly of dust the way all true vintage pieces do. She should know. She found the beautiful 50s blue linen dress she's wearing right now under similar circumstances. She shakes out the coat and holds it up to get a better look. It's even better than she first thought. It's a military great coat, and it looks a great deal older than it did while slung over the couch. She'd guess that it's several hundred years old, easily. It might be the oldest piece she's ever seen at a yard sale like this. Surely the owners of this house aren't just selling this coat, it must be out here by mistake. A coat like this, with its age and likely linked to military history, could be in a museum. She catches the attention of the homeowner, an older woman showing off a chipped tea set, and calls her over. She asks the old woman about the coat, wondering where it came from, how old it is, and most importantly, how much does she want for it? The old woman regards the coat with confusion, insisting that she's never seen it before in her life. It didn't belong to her late husband, her father, her grandfather. She has no idea where it came from. If the younger woman likes it so much, she can just pay $5 for it and call it a day. Thrilled at her good luck, the yard sale enthusiast hands the old lady a crumpled $5 bill and takes her prize. On the walk home, she continues examining the coat. No tag, no label, nothing to indicate when it was made or what army might have used it. She doesn't recognize it from any particular era or nation. Between that and the fact that the old lady at the yard sale claimed she had no idea where it came from, the coat seems to be one big mystery. Depending on the angle she looks at it from, it could be from World War I or it could be from the 1600s. She's a history teacher. She should be able to put her finger on it, but she just can't. When she gets home, she rushes upstairs to her full-length mirror, cranks the air conditioning up, she doesn't want to sweat all over an antique after all, and throws the coat on. Maybe taking a look at the silhouette of the garment on a person, in this case, herself, will help her make a better estimate of the coat's origin. She slides an arm into each sleeve and takes a look. Not too bad. Definitely too heavy for summer, but it's beautifully constructed and definitely a genuine historical garment. It's going to make an amazing addition to her collection of vintage clothes, and in the winter, she'll be able to stay warm in it on the walk to work. She's just about to remove the coat when she feels someone tap her on the shoulder. She spins around, gasping in shock. Is someone in the house? But when she looks behind her, there's no one there. She calls out to the empty room. Hello? Of course, no one answers, and she kicks herself for acting like the foolish main character in some scary movie. If there's an intruder in the house, they're not just going to answer her. But she can't hear anything, can't see anywhere an intruder might have hidden after tapping her shoulder. She must be imagining things. There's no one here. She reaches for one of the coat sleeves again, and again there's the feeling of someone tapping her on the shoulder. But this time, it doesn't stop. The tapping becomes a hand resting on her shoulder, then pushing past her shoulder and along her arm. She doesn't know how, it should be impossible, but the hand is inside the coat with her. She stares into the mirror, mouth open in shock. 
as a pale hand pokes out of the armhole, hovering just over her own hand. It wiggles its fingers, as if giving her a friendly wave. Horrified and unable to figure out what else to do, she yanks the coat off and throws it to the floor. What else do you do when your new vintage coat starts waving at you with its own hands? Looking at the coat lying on the floor in a heap, it's hard to believe that something so unusual happened only a second ago. Or did it? That's impossible, it must have been heat exhaustion or her overactive imagination. Against her better judgment, she picks the coat back up and throws it over her shoulders again. No sooner has she tugged the sleeves over her arms than she feels the presence of something else in the coat with her. This time, two hands emerge from the sleeves, waving at her frantically in the mirror. She makes a move to take the coat off again, but one of the hands gives her a thumbs down, as if begging her not to. Well, what else do you do when the strange, magical coat from the yard sale tries to communicate with you using hands that appeared from nowhere? You listen. She tries to ask the hands questions, remembering the sign language course she took in college, but they don't seem to understand what she's saying. She asks them if they're the ghost of a fallen soldier haunting the coat. She asks if they can tell her anything about where the coat came from, but all they do is wave. Maybe that's because they don't have eyes, they can't see what she's trying to tell them. Eventually, the hands seem to give up, disappearing back into the lining of the jacket. She's about to take it off again, when she feels something slimy slip up her back, emerging from the coat's lining. It wriggles against her spine like a worm before sliding out of the collar and up her cheek. In the mirror, she can see it, though she wishes she couldn't. It's a tentacle, like that of a massive octopus she once saw in an aquarium. It suctions to her cheek, and she can't take it anymore. She needs to get this coat off now. She begins tugging at the sleeves, pulling it off, turning one of the sleeves inside out in the process, and the tentacle takes notice. It wraps itself around her throat, trying to hold her inside of the coat, squeezing tighter and tighter. She thrashes, ripping at the fabric and raking the tentacle with her nails, but it only squeezes tighter and tighter still, cutting off her air supply. Her eyes bulge, her mouth gapes wide, gasping for air as she fights for life. The only way to escape is to get the coat off, but every time she tries, the tentacle only squeezes tighter around her throat. She can feel other hands, some human, some with sharp claws that dig into her skin, some covered in fur, all grabbing hold of her and pulling her back into the coat. The fight between the woman and the coat full of arms pulls her to the floor, where she struggles violently, throwing her body back and forth as she wrestles with the limbs grabbing hold of her. She tries to scream, but can't get enough air into her lungs to make any sound but a pathetic squeak. During the struggle, she winds up with the coat stretched over her head, holding onto her by the neck and two arms. She breaks free, and the coat falls on top of her head like a blanket. And then, suddenly, where there was once a woman and dozens of inhuman hands, there is now just a simple wool coat lying on the ground in an unassuming pile of fabric. She's gone, vanished without a trace. Meanwhile, across town, an old woman with a yard sale sign in her yard gets a visit from a van full of strange men claiming to be members of an elite research organization. They lost something very important and tracked it to her simple small town yard sale. She gives them the information of the woman who purchased the missing item, but by the time they reach her home, she's gone. No matter, one less witness to wipe the memory of. They collect the coat, pile into their van, and carry it back to the SCP Foundation site it was swiped from. No one is certain how it left containment, but they're relieved to once again have custody of SCP-262. SCP-262 is a light brown European military-style greatcoat a cursory examination of its style led researchers to estimate its period of origin to be anywhere from the late 1500s to the early 1900s. Narrowing it down to a smaller window has proven difficult. The jacket has no specific markings, tags, or other designations, causing the research staff to theorize that it was an original sample design intended to be pitched to military officials for approval as a new official uniform. Then, it was either lost or rejected, resulting in it never being put into wider use. The coat is made of wool and is cut to fall below the knee on most individuals who wear it. Attempts at carbon dating the fibers of the coat have been inconclusive, and contrary to the apparent visual style of the coat, places the age of the wool at around 6200 to 6400 years old. The wool itself is thousands of years old, while the coat was made more recently. Of course, the uncertain age of the coat is far from its only anomalous property. 
SCP-262 is able to manifest a number of arms from its dark inner lining. Any subject wearing the coat may open it in order to materialize hands and arms from within. These arms are, at least some of the time, under the control of the wearer. These limbs can vary widely in skin tone, length, and strength. Some of the arms observed since the item came into Foundation custody include a reptilian scaled tentacle, approximately 13 feet in length, four semi-transparent cellulose appendages over 33 feet long, with four fingers, two elbow-like joints, and no apparent wrists, the clawed paw of a large predatory cat resembling a cougar or mountain lion, as well as a wide variety of feet and legs that manifest at random. The space within SCP-262's lining is regarded as non-Euclidean in nature, and the coat itself is considered a link to an extra-dimensional space. During initial testing, Subject 402M was asked to put SCP-262 over his head in order to see what would happen. When he did so, the coat promptly fell to the ground in a heap as 402M vanished beneath it. Several months later, Fingerprint analysis of an object handled by a human arm that appeared from within the coat identified that arm as belonging to Subject 402M. This incident suggests that some, if not all, of the limbs within the coat belong to beings trapped inside the coat's extra-dimensional space. Wearing the coat in an ordinary manner does not result in the subject disappearing into the space within. Subjects wearing SCP-262 as intended, one arm through each sleeve, the coat across the back, you've presumably worn a coat before and know what I'm describing here, find themselves able to manipulate the arms that emanate from within. The amount of control the subject has over these limbs varies. For instance, Test Subject 301F was able to multitask while blindfolded, navigating her environment in such a way that seemed to indicate some degree of awareness of surroundings on the part of SCP-262. The coat seems to maintain this awareness even when the person wearing it cannot see or hear anything around them. Some members of the research team believe that SCP-262 is fully sentient. They arrived at this conclusion after witnessing SCP-262 playing a piano with two or more hands, even though the test subject wearing it had no musical training, defending itself and its subject from multiple attackers, several of the limbs fighting each other or defying the will of the subject. The Foundation first acquired the coat when the administrator relinquished ownership of it in the late 20th century. The administrator, due to his status, is not required to disclose the origins of the coat or what he might have done with it in the past. All he said about the coat upon parting with it was, In the right hands, it could be extremely useful. In the wrong hands, it could be extremely dangerous. In my hands, it was becoming extremely dusty and moth-ridden and taking up far too much space in my closet. Additional research notes were attached to the SCP-262 file. After perusing these notes, I compiled the most interesting findings for further review. I hope you will find them as thought-provoking as I have. During Trial 7, Subject 722M was instructed to put the coat on properly, then turn the right arm sleeve inside out as he removed his arm from the garment. When he did, a chorus of disembodied voices began to cry out in pain. In spite of this, 722M was ordered to continue inverting the sleeve. At this point, several arms emerged from the lining of SCP-262 and attacked the test subject in apparent self-defense. Subject 722M attempted to retract his arm from the coat, but in the process of doing so, he inverted the sleeve further. This pushed the coat too far, and the long, cellulitic arm emerged from the inner lining of the opposite side, reached around, and up through the inverted sleeve, grabbed hold of 722M's hand and gave it a violent yank. The force of this pull was enough to dislocate the subject's shoulder and injure him severely. Once the coat had returned itself to its preferred position, the chorus of voices silenced, and the arms retreated out of sight. Subject 722M was removed from the coat and given medical attention. His current condition is noted as inconsequential. During Case Study 262-42, SCP-262 was placed on a mannequin. First, SCP-262 was placed on an anatomically correct male mannequin, dressed in attire consistent with an average SCP Foundation personnel. After a few minutes passed, one single human arm stretched out of the inner lining of the coat, reaching up to touch the mannequin's face. It poked and prodded the face curiously a few times, then retreated out of sight and did not emerge again. The following day, researchers placed SCP-262 over the head and shoulders of another male mannequin. After a few moments, the coat collapsed to the ground, and the entire test mannequin disappeared. 
An added research note revealed that a wooden arm, resembling that of the test mannequin, was spotted emerging from SCP-262 on several occasions following the trial. This further confirms the hypothesis that the limbs inside of the coat originate from entities that were somehow trapped inside. During Case Study 262-307, research staff attempted to observe the behavior of SCP-262 when placed on the body of a recently deceased human being. After a Class D personnel was terminated during an experiment with an undisclosed SCP, the body was placed on a chair in a seated position. The coat was then placed on the body. After several moments, a human arm emerged from the lining of SCP-262, reaching toward the corpse's face. It poked at the face a few times before disappearing back into the coat. A few minutes passed, and then the body began to shake violently. A popping and snapping sound could be heard, and the hands, which had been poking out of the sleeves, vanished from view. The body then went still again, and a human hand reached up the back of its neck, coming from the collar, and pulled the head into an upright position. Then, an array of other hands and arms crisscrossed over the chest and abdomen, straightening the body's posture. As the research staff watched, two arms, cellulitic in nature, grabbed the ankles and legs, pulling the body up into a standing position. Even more arms came down each sleeve. The coat's limbs worked as a combined unit to pilot the body and managed to escape from the observation room and overpower the security stationed outside. SCP-262 continued to pilot the corpse through the Foundation site, attempting to break out. Guided by exceptionally strong limbs, the animated body was able to knock security guards out of the way, even seizing a weapon from one of them, resulting in several casualties. Who knows what might have happened if MTF Epsilon-9, the Fire Eaters, hadn't been in the building at the time. It's possible that SCP-262 might have escaped the facility altogether, making its way into the general population. Using their flame accelerators as aggressively as possible, the MTF members managed to corner SCP-262 at the far side of a hallway. With nowhere to turn, SCP-262 resorted to an emergency escape plan. One of the hands from within the coat pulled the garment up and over the head of the corpse it was piloting. SCP-262 collapsed to the ground, the body vanishing beneath it and leaving the mobile task force without a target. At this point, it is unknown whether this escape attempt was driven by the will of SCP-262 itself or some sort of residual consciousness from the body of the deceased Class D personnel used in the experiment. At this point in time, SCP-262 is under review and additional research to see if it could be useful to field agents attempting to contain other SCPs. At this time, agents are not permitted to use SCP-262 without supervision by a staff member with commander-level authority. Whenever SCP-262 is not in use, it is to be kept in a climate-controlled room at an undisclosed Foundation site, guarded by at least two Level 2 security personnel at any given time. It is unlikely that SCP-262 will make its way back into the general population anytime soon, unless it finds itself in possession of a wearer willing to help it get there. Still, if you ever happen to be browsing a thrift shop or yard sale and happen upon a vintage military jacket that entices you to try it on, do so with caution. You might find yourself in need of some help, though you won't need anyone to lend a hand. You'll have plenty of those. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-674, the exposition gun, makes Nintendo real life.